XXXV Second visit to America On 20th June 1899, the Swami boarded the steamer Golconda and was off for the west. In the Bay of Bengal, the sea was exceedingly rough. On the 24th, the ship touched at Madras. Here a great crowd was waiting, for the news of the Swami's coming had been telegraphed on, but on account of plague in Calcutta, the Indian passengers were not allowed to land. This was a great disappointment to the whole city. Old friends and disciples of the Swami, as also Swami Ramakrishnananda and others came in boats alongside the steamer, bringing fruits, flowers and other offerings to the Swami, who greeted them from the railing and talked to them until fatigue overcame him. Alaysinga Perumal, that devoted worker, was especially anxious to consult the Swami concerning the management of the Brahmavdin magazine and for this reason he purchased a ticket to Colombo. At Colombo the Swami received a great ovation. He was glad to see his old friends again, among whom were Sir Kumaraswami and Mr. Arunachalam. He visited Mrs. Higgins' boarding school for Buddhist girls and also the convent and school of his old acquaintance, the Countess Canovera. The steamer left Colombo on the morning of 28th June. It was monsoon time and the ship tossed heavily all the way to Aden, which was reached in ten instead of the usual six days. At Socotra, the monsoon was fiercest, this being its very centre, as the captain remarked to the Swami. Beyond this point the sea was comparatively calm. The steamer reached Aden on 8th July and Suez, through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, on the 14th. After touching at Naples, it went on to Marseilles, and the Swami was in London on 31st July. For the sister and the Swami's Guru Bhai, this voyage was a pilgrimage and an education. Sister Nivedita has recorded in her charming style, in the Master as I saw him some of the striking conversations of the Swami from her diary and her impressions. These being of absorbing interest to the readers of the Swami's life, as they show the Master in varying moods, the biographers need make no apology for making the following quotations from them. Writes the Sister From the beginning of the voyage to the end, the low of thought and story went on. One never knew what moment would set the flash of intuition and hear the ringing utterance of some fresh truth. It was while we sat chatting in the river on the first afternoon that he suddenly exclaimed, Yes, I the older I grow, the more everything seems to me to lie in manliness. This is my new gospel. Do even evil like a man. Be wicked, if you must, on a great scale. And these words link themselves in my memory with those of another day, when I had been reminding him of the rareness of criminality in India. And he turned on me, full of sorrowful protest. Would to God it were otherwise in my land, he said, for this is verily the virtuousness of death. Stories of the Shivarfitri, or Dark Night of Shiva, of Prithvi Rai, of the judgment seat of Vikramaditya, of Buddha and Yashodhra, and a thousand more were constantly coming up. And a noticeable point was that one never heard the same thing twice. There was the perpetual study of caste, the constant examination and restatement of ideas, the talk of work, past, present and future, and, above all, the vindication of humanity, never abandoned, never weakened, always rising to new heights of defence of the undefended, of chivalry for the weak. I cannot forget his indignation when he heard some European reference to cannibalism as if it were a normal part of the life in some societies. That is not true, he said, when he had heard to the end. No nation ever ate human flesh, save as a religious sacrifice, or in war, out of revenge. Don't you see? That is not the way of gregarious animals. It would cut at the roots of social life, asterisk Kropotkin's great work on mutual aid had not yet appeared when these words were said. 
it was his love of humanity and his instinct on behalf of each in his own place that gave to the Swami so clear an insight. Again he talked of religious impulse. Sex love and creation, he cried, these are at the root of most religions. And these in India are called Vaishnavism and in the West Christianity. How few have dared to worship death or Kali? Let us worship death. Let us embrace the terrible because it is terrible, not asking that it be toned down. Let us take misery for misery's own sake, asterisk. As we came to the place where the river water met the ocean, the Swami explained how it was the great reverence of Hindus for the ocean, forbidding them to defile it by crossing it, that had made such journeys equal to outcasting for so many centuries. Then, as the ship crossed the line, touching the sea for the first time, he chanted, Namali Shivai. Nama Shivai. He was talking again of the fact that lie who would be great must suffer, and how some were fated to sack every joy of the senses turned to ashes, and he said, The whole of life is only a swan song. Now he would answer a question, with infinite patience, and again he would play with historic and literary speculations. Again and again his mind would return to the Buddhist period, as the crux of a real understanding of Indian history. The three cycles of Buddhism, he said one day, were 500 years of the I, Ao, 500 years of images, and 500 years of Tantras. You must not imagine that there was ever a religion in India called Buddhism, with temples and priests of its own order I nothing of the sort. It was always within Hinduism. Only at one time the influence of Buddha was paramount and this made the nation monastic. And Lai drifted on to talk about the Soma plant, picturing how for a thousand years after the Himalayan period, it was annually received in Indian villages as if it were a king, the people going out to meet it on a given day and bringing it in rejoicing. And now it cannot even be identified. Yes, Buddha was right. It must be cause and effect in karma. This individuality cannot but be an illusion. It was the next morning and I had supposed him to be dozing in his chair when he suddenly exclaimed, Why? The memory of one life is like millions of years of confinement and they want to wake up the memory of many lives. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I have just been talking to Turiyananda about conservative and liberal ideas, he said as he met me on deck before breakfast one morning and straightway plunged into the subject. The conservative's whole ideal is submission. Your ideal is struggle. Consequently, it is we who enjoy life and never you. You are always striving to change yours to something better and before a millionth part of the change is carried out, you die. The Western ideal is to be doing, the Eastern to be suffering. The perfect life would be a wonderful harmony between doing and suffering. But that can never be. In our system it is accepted that a man can never have all he desires. Life is subjected to many restraints. This is ugly yet it brings out points of light and strength. Our liberals see only the ugliness and try to throw it off. But they substitute something quite as bad and the new custom takes as long as the old for us to work to its centers of strength. Will is not strengthened by change. It is weakened and enslaved by it. But we must be always absorbing. Will grows stronger by absorption. And consciously or unconsciously, will is the one thing in the world that we admire. Sati is great in the eyes of the whole world because of the will that it manifests. It is selfishness that we must seek to eliminate. I, I find that whenever I have made a mistake in my life, it has always been because Selj entered into the calculation. Where self has not been involved, my judgment has gone straight to the mark.
Without this self, there would have been no religious system. If man had not wanted anything for himself, do you think he would have had all this praying and worship? Why I he would never have thought of God at all, except perhaps for a little praise now and then, at the sight of a beautiful landscape or something. And that is the only attitude there ought to be. All praise and thanks. If only we were rid of self I. You are quite wrong, Lai said again, when you think that fighting is a sign of growth. It is not so at all. Absorption is the sign. Hinduism is the very genius of absorption. We have never cared for fighting. Of course we struck a blow now and then, in defense of our homes I that was right. But we never cared for fighting for its own sake. Everyone had to learn that. So let these races of numerous world on I Dale all be taken into Hinduism in the end I. He never thought of his mother church or his motherland except as dominant, and again and again, when thinking of definite schemes, he would ejaculate, in his whimsical way, yes, it is true. If European men or women are to work in India, it must be under the black man. He brooded much over the national achievement. Well, well, he would say, we have done one thing that no other people ever did. We have converted a whole nation to one or two ideas. non be cf eating for instance. Not one Hindu eats beef. No, no. Turning sharply round, it is not at all like European non cat eating, for beef was formerly the food of the country one. We were discussing a certain opponent of his own, and I suggested that he was guilty of putting his sect above his country. That is Asiatic, retorted the Swami warmly, and it is grand. Only he had not the brain to conceive, nor the patience to wait, and then he went off into a musing on Kali. I love terror for its own sake, he went on, despair for its own sake, misery for its own sake. Fight always. Fight and fight on, though always in defeat. That's the ideal. That's the ideal. The totality of all souls, not the human alone, he said once, is the personal God. The will of the totality nothing can resist. It is what we know as law. And this is what we mean by Shiva and Kali and so on. It was dark when we approached Sicily, and against the sunset sky, Etna was in slight eruption. As we entered the Straits of Messina, the moon rose, and I walked up and down the deck beside the Swami while he dwelt on the fact that beauty is not external, but already in the mind. On one side frowned the dark crags of the Italian coast, on the other, the island was touched with silver light. Messina must thank me, he said, it is I who give her all her beauty. Then he talked of the fever of longing to reach God that had wakened in him as a boy, and of how he would begin repeating a text before Sunrise, and remain all day repeating it, without stirring. He was trying here to explain the idea of tapasya, in answer to my questions, and he spoke of the old way of lighting four fires, and sitting in the midst, hour after hour, with the sun overhead, reigning in the mind. Worship the terrible, he ended, worship death. All else is vain. All struggle is vain. That is the last lesson. Yet this is not the coward's love of death, not the love of the weak or the suicide. It is the welcome of the strong man who has sounded everything to its depths and knows that there is no alternative. Often during the voyage the Swami talked of those saints whom he had known personally. Paramount was Sri Ramakrishna of whom he told, among many other things, how with but a touch he could impart the highest insight, as instanced in the case of the lad who never spoke the remaining ten years of his life, save to say, My Beloved. My Beloved, after being touched by the Master's hand. 
and he spoke also of a certain woman who on being offered salutation by the master in the name of the mother, by throwing flowers on her feet and burning incense before her, passed immediately into the deepest samadhi, from which it was most difficult to recall her to sense consciousness till two or three hours had elapsed. Before she left, none had the forethought to make a single inquiry as to her name or abode. She never came again. Thus her memory became like some beautiful legend treasured in the order as witness to the worship of Sri Ramakrishna for gracious and noble wifehood and motherhood. Had he not said of this woman, a fragment of the eternal Madonnahood? Was it a joke, the Swami said, that Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa should touch a life? Of course he made new men and new women of those who came to him, even in these fleeting contacts, asterisk. And then he would tell story after story of different disciples. How one came, and came again, struggled to understand. And suddenly to this one he turned and said, Go away now, and make some money. Then come again. And that man today was succeeding in the world, but the old love was proving itself ever a light. Asterisk The Swami spoke with great feeling of Nag Mahdashaya, who had paid him a visit in Calcutta only a few weeks before his departure. Nag Mahashir, he said again and again, was one of the greatest of the works of Ramakrishna Parmahamsa. He related how on one occasion he had cut down the supporting pole of his cottage in order to make the fire to cook food for a guest. Speaking of the modern saints of Hindustan, such as Pavhari Baba, Trilanga Swami, Raghunath Das and others, as also of those of ancient times. His whole soul went to the interpretation of each, as he rose before him and it would have been impossible at any moment for the listener to think of any other as higher. Raghunath Das had been dead two months when the Swami reached his ashrama. He had been a soldier originally in the British service, and as an outpost sentinel was faithful and good, and much beloved by his officers. One night, however, Lai heard a Ramrama party. He tried to do his duty, but Jai Balo Rama Klandra Ki Jai P maddened him. He threw away his arms and uniform and joined the worship. This went on for some time till reports came to the colonel. He sent for Raghunath Das and asked him whether these were true and if he knew the penalty. Yes, he knew it. It was to be shot. Well, said the colonel, go away this time and I shall repeat it to no one. This once I forgive you. But if the same thing happens again, you must suffer the penalty. That night, however, the sentinel heard again the Ramarama party. He did his best, but it was irresistible. At last he threw all to the winds and joined the worshippers till morning. Meanwhile, however, the colonel's trust in Raghunath Das had been so great that he found it difficult to believe anything against him, even on his own confession. So in the course of the night, he visited the outpost to see for himself. Now, Raghunath Das was in his place and exchanged the word with him three times. Then, being reassured, the colonel turned in and went to sleep. In the morning appeared Raghunath Das to report himself and surrender his arms. But the report was not accepted, for the colonel told him what he had himself seen and heard. Thunderstruck, the man insisted by some means on retiring from the service. Rama it was who had done this for his servant. Henceforth, in very truth, he would serve no other. He became a Vairagi said the Swami on the banks of the Saraswati. People thought him ignorant, but I knew his power. Daily he would feed thousands. Then would come the grain seller, after a while, with his bill. H asterisk ML asterisk Raghunath Das would say, A thousand rupees you say. Let me see. 
It is a month I think since I have received anything. This will come, I fancy, tomorrow, asterisk, and it always came. And then, perhaps came the story of Sibirana. Ah, yes, exclaimed the teller, as he ended, these are the stories that are deep in our nation's heart. Never forget that the sannyasin takes to woes, one to realize the truth, and one to help the world, and that the most stringent of stringent requirements is that he should renounce any thought of heaven, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. One day the talk drifted to the question of what becomes of those who failed to keep their woes. Quoting the memorable shlokas of the Gita on the point. First he explained how everything, short of the absolute control of mind, word and deed, was but the sowing of wild oats. Then he told how the religious who failed would sometimes be honed again to a throne, there to sow his wild oats asterisk, in gratifying the particular desire which had led to his downfall. A memory of the religious habit, asterisk he said, often haunts the throne, asterisk, for one of the signs of greatness was held to be the persistence of a faint memory. Akbar had had this memory. He thought of himself as a Brahmatmri who had failed in his woes. But he would be born again in more favourable surroundings and that time he would succeed. And then there came one of those personal glimpses which occurred so seldom with our master. Carried away by the talk of memory, he lifted the wiser for a moment on his own soul. And whatever you may think, he said, turning to me suddenly and addressing me by name, I have such a memory. His voice sunk into silence and we sat looking out over the starlit sea. Then he took up the thread again. As I grow older I find that I look more and more for greatness in little things. I want to know what great man cats and wears and how he speaks to his servants. I want to find a Sir Philip Sidney greatness. Few men would remember the thirst of others, even in the moment of death. But any one will be great in a great position. Even the coward will grow brave in the glare of the footlights. The world looks on. Whose heart will not throb? Whose pulse will not quicken till he can do his best? More and more the true greatness seems to me that of the worm, doing its duty silently, steadily, from moment to moment, and hour to hour, asterisk. How many points on the map have received a new beauty in my eyes from the conversations they recall? As we passed up the coast of Italy, we talked of the church. As we went through the Straits of Bonifacio and sat looking at the south coast of Corsica, he spoke in a hushed voice of this land of the birth of the warlord Asterisk and wandered far afield to talk of the strength of Robespierre or to touch on Victor Hugo Asterisk's contempt for Napoleon III with his it to Napoleon Asterisk. As I came on deck, on the morning of our passing through the Straits of Gibraltar, he met me with the words, Have you seen them? Have you seen them? Landing there and crying, the end in. The faith. The faith. And for half an hour I was swept away into his dramatization of the Moorish invasions of Spain. Or again, on a Sunday evening, Lai would sit, and talk of Buddha putting new life into the customary historical recital of bare facts and interpreting the great renunciation as it had appeared to him who made it. But his talks were not all entertaining, nor even all educational. Every now and then he would return, with consuming eagerness, to the great purpose of his life. And when he did this, I listened with an anxious mind, striving to treasure up each word that he let fall. For I knew that here I was but the transmitter, but the bridge between him and that countless host of his own people, who would yet arise and seek to make good his dreams. One of these occasions came on a certain evening, as we neared Aden. I had asked him, in the morning, to tell me, in broad outline, 
what he felt to be the points of difference between his own schemes for the good of India and those preached by others. It was impossible to draw him out on this subject. On the contrary, he expressed appreciation of certain personal characteristics and lines of conduct adopted by some of the leaders of other schools, and I regarded the question as dismissed. Suddenly, in the evening, he returned to the subject of his own accord. I disagree with all those, he said, who are giving their superstitions back to my people. Like the Egyptologists' interest in Egypt, it is easy to feel an interest in India that is purely selfish. One may desire to see again the India of one's books, one's studies, one's dreams. My hope is to see again the strong points of that India, reinforced by the strong points of this age, only in a natural way. The new state of things must be a growth from within. So I preach only the Upanishads. If you look, you will find that I have never quoted anything but the Upanishads. And of the Upanishads, it is only that one idea, strength. The quintessence of Vedas and Vedanta and all lies in that one word. Buddha's teaching was of non-resistance or non-injury. But I think this is a better way of teaching the same thing. For behind that non-injury lay a dreadful weakness. It is weakness that conceives the idea of resistance. I do not think of punishing or escaping from a drop of sea spray. It is nothing to me. Wet to the mosquito it would be serious. Now, I will make all injury like that. Strength and fearlessness. My own ideal is that giant of a saint whom they killed in the Mutini, and who broke silence, when stabbed to the heart, to say, And thou also art he. But you may ask, what is the place of Ramakrishna in this scheme? He is the method, that wonderful unconscious method. He did not understand himself. He knew nothing of England or the English, save that they were queer folk from over the sea. But he lived that great life, and I read the meaning. Never a word of condemnation for any. Once I had been attacking one of our sects of diabolists. I had been raving on for three hours, and he had listened quietly. Well, well, said the old male as I finished, perhaps every house may have a back door. Who knows? Hitherto the great fault of our Indian religion has lain in its knowing only two words, renunciation and mukti. Only mukti here. Nothing for the householders. But, these are the very people whom I want to help. For, are not all souls of the same quality? Is not the goal of all the same? And so strength must come to the nation through education. I thought at the time, and I think increasingly as I consider it, that this one talk of my master had been well worth the whole voyage to have heard. The Swami was constantly preoccupied with the thought of Hinduism as a whole, and this fact found recurring expression in references to Vaishnavism. He loved to dwell on the spectacle of the historical emergence of Hinduism. He sought constantly for the great force behind the evolution of any given phenomenon. Where was the thinker behind the founder of a religion? And where, on the other hand, was the heart to complete the thought? Buddha had received his philosophy of the five categories, form, feeling, sensation, motion, knowledge, from Kapila. But Buddha had brought the love that made the philosophy live. Of no one of these, Kapila had said, can anything be declared? For each is not. It but was, and is gone. Each is but the ripple on the water. No, O oh man! Thou art the sea. Krishna, in his turn, as the preacher and creative center of popular Hinduism, awoke in the Swami a feeling which was scarcely second to his passionate, personal adoration of Buddha. Compared to his manicidedness, the sannyasa of Buddha was almost a weakness. 
How wonderful was the Gita! How strong! But besides this, there was the beauty of it. The Gita, after the Buddhist writings, was such a relief. Buddha had constantly said, I am for the people. And they bad crushed, in his name, the vanity of art and learning. The great mistake committed by Buddhism lay in the destruction of the old, for the Buddhist books were torture to read. Having been written for the ignorant, one would find only one or two thoughts in a huge volume. The Dliyamapda he placed, however, on a level with the Gita. It was to meet the need thus roused that the Puranas were intended. There had been only one mind in India that had foreseen this need, that of Krishna, probably the greatest man who ever lived. He recognized once the need of the people and the desirability of preserving all that had already been gained. Nor are the Gopi story and the Gita, which speaks again and again of women and Shudras, the only forms in which he reached the masses. For the whole Mahabharata is his, carried out by his worshippers, and it begins with the declaration that it is for the people. Thus is created a religion that ends in the worship of Vishnu as the preservation and enjoyment of life, leading to the realization of God. Our last movement, Gaitanism, you remember, was for enjoyment. The Swami was characterizing the doctrine here, he was not speaking of the unsurpassed personal asceticism of Chaitanya. At the same time, Jainism represents the other extreme, the slow destruction of the body by self-torture. Hence Buddhism, you see, is reformed Jainism, and this is the real meaning of Buddha's leaving the company of the five ascetics. In India, in every age, there is a cycle of sects, which represents every gradation of physical practice, from the extreme of self-torture to the extreme of excess. And during the same period will always be developed a metaphysical cycle, which represents the realization of God as taking place by every gradation of means, from that of using the senses as an instrument, to that of the annihilation of the senses. Thus Hinduism always consists, as it were, of two counter-spirals, completing each other round a single axis. Yes, Vaishnavism says, it is all right. This tremendous love for father, for mother, for brother, husband or child. It is all right if only you will think that Krishna is the child and when you give him food that you are feeding Krishna. This was the cry of Chaitanya. Worship, Jod through the senses. As against that vicedentic cry, control the senses. Suppress the senses. At the present moment, we may see three different positions of the national religion, the Orthodox, the Arya Samaj, and the Brahino Sanaj. The Orthodox covers the ground taken by the Vedic Hindus of the Mahabharata epoch. The Arya Samaj corresponds with Jainism and the Brahmo Sanaj with the Buddhists. I see that India is a young and living organism. Europe also is young and living. Neither has arrived at such a stage of development that we can safely criticize its institutions. They are to great experiments, neither of which is yet complete. In India, we have social communism with the light of Advait, that is, spiritual individualism playing on and around it in Europe. You are socially individualists, but your thought is dualistic, which is spiritual communism. Thus the one consists of social institutions hedged in by individualistic thought, while the other is made up of individualist institutions within the hedge of communistic thought. Now we must help the Indian experiment as it is. Movements which do not attempt to help things as they are, are, from that point of view, no good. In Europe, for instance, I respect marriage as highly as non-marriage. Never forget that a man is made great and perfect as much by his faults as by his virtues. So we must not seek to rob a nation of its character, even if it could be proved that the character was all false. 
His mind was extraordinarily clear on the subject of what he meant by individualism. How often has he said to me, you do not yet understand India. We Indians are man-worshippers, after all. Our God is man. He meant here the great individual man, the man of self-realization, Buddha, Krishna, the Guru, the Mahapurusha. But on another occasion, using the same word in an entirely different sense, he said, this idea of man-worship, that is to say, the worship of the manhood which exists in any man, in all men, apart from their individual achievement of thought or character, humanity exists in nucleus in India, but it has never been expanded. You must develop it. Make poetry, make art of it. Establish the worship of the feet of beggars, as you had it in medieval Europe. Make man worshippers. He was equally clear, again, about the value of the image. You may always say, he said, that the image is God. The error you have to avoid is to think God the image, asterisk, he was appealed to, on one occasion, to condemn the fetishism of the hot and taught. I do not. No, he answered, what fetishism is. A lurid picture was hastily put before him, of the object alternately worshipped, beaten and thanked. Seven do that, he exclaimed. Don't you sec, he went on, a moment later, in hot resentment of injustice done to the lowly and absent, don't you see that there is no fetishism? Oh, your hearts are steeled that you cannot see that the child is right. The child sex persons everywhere. Knowledge robs us of the child's vision. But at last, through higher knowledge, we win back to it. He connects a living power with rocks, slicks, trees, and the rest. And is there not a living power behind them? It is symbolism, not fetishism. Can you not see? But while every sincere ejaculation was thus sacred to him, he never forgot for a moment the importance of the philosophy of Hinduism. And lie would throw perpetual flashes of poetry into the illustration of such arguments as are known to lawyers. How lovingly he would dwell upon the Mimanska philosophy. With what pride he would remind the listener that, according to Hindu savants, the whole universe is only the meaning of words. After the word comes the thing. Therefore, the idea is all L asterisk and indeed, as he expounded it, the daring of the Mindamsaka argument, the fearlessness of its admissions, and the firmness of its inferences, appeared as the very glory of Hinduism. One day he told the story of Satyabhama's sacrifice, and how the word Krishna, written on a piece of paper, and thrown into the balances, made Krishna himself, on the other side, kick the beam. Orthodox Hinduism he began, makes Shruti, the sound, everything. The thing is but a feeble manifestation of the pre-existing and eternal idea. So the name of God is everything. God himself is merely the objectification of that idea in the eternal mind. Your own name is infinitely more perfect than the person. You L the name of God is greater than God, guard you your speech, asterisk surely there has never been another religious system so fearless of truth. As he talked, one saw that the whole turned on the unspoken conviction, self-apparent to the oriental mind, that religion is not a creed, but an experience, a process, as the Swami himself has elsewhere said, of being and becoming. If it be true that this process leads inevitably from the apprehension of the manifold to the realization of the One, then it must also be true that everything is in the mind and that the material is nothing more than the concretizing of ideas. Thus the Greek philosophy of Plato is included within the Hindu philosophy of the Mimamsakas and a doctrine that sounds merely Ainpiri on the lips of Europe finds reason and necessity on those of India. In the same way, as one declaring a truth self-evident, lie explained on one occasion. 
I would not worship even the Greek gods, for they were separate from humanity. Only those should be worshipped who are like ourselves, but greater. The difference between the gods and me must be a difference only of degree. But his references to philosophy did not by any means always consist of these Epicurean tidbits. He was merciless, as a rule, in the demand for intellectual effort and would hold a group of unlearned listeners through an analysis of early systems for a couple of hours at a stretch without suspecting them of weariness or difficulty. Nor would Western speculations pass forgotten in this great restoration of the path the race had come by. For his was a mind which saw only the seeking, pursuing inquiry of man, making no arbitrary distinction as between ancient and modern. In this way he would run over all the six systems of Hindu philosophy, analyzing, comparing, reconciling one with the other, and showing their points of difference from Buddhism. Thus he dwelt long and minutely on the Vaisheshika and the Nyaya philosophy in particular, side by side with that of the Vedanta and of Kant. He concluded by saying, One set of persons, you see, gives priority to the external manifestation, the other to the internal ideal. Which is prior, the bird to the egg, or the egg to the bird? Does the all hold the cup, or the cup the all? This is a problem of which there is no solution. Give it up. Escape from Maya. But the Swami was not occupied all the time with problems, free from the cares of public life, he was often jovial, and gave himself up to fun and merriment with his Guru Bhai and his disciple. He enjoyed the long sea voyage and fulfilled his promise to the editor of the Udbodhan by writing Bengali articles for the paper. These were for the greater part penned in the most delightful and humorous style, interspersed here and there with serious and instructive thoughts, both secular and spiritual. These contributions were later collected and made into a book called Parivrajka or The Itinerant Monk. This is, indeed, from one point of view, a singular production, being in its nature untranslatable keeping to its native spirit, and shows that he could have been the Mark Twain of Bengali literature if he had so wished. Thus passed the time, until on 31st July, the party arrived in London to be met on landing at the Tilbury Dock by many friends and disciples of the Swami. Among them were, much to his surprise, two American ladies who had come all the way from Detroit to meet him in London, having seen in an Indian magazine that he would sail from India on 20th June, and especially because they were alarmed at the reports they had heard regarding his health. One of these, Mrs. Funk, describing his appearance, says, He had grown very slim and looked and acted like a boy. He was so happy to find that the voyage had brought back some of the old strength and vigour. It being the off-season period in London, the Swami remained but two weeks in Wimbledon, a suburb of the metropolis, where quarters were found in a roomy old-fashioned house. It was very quiet and restful, and all spent a happy time there. With the exception of several conversations, the Swami did no public work in London at this time. On 16th August, in response to the many invitations which constantly reached him from America, he left London, accompanied by Swami Turiyananda and his American disciples. Of the voyage across the Atlantic, Mrs. Funk writes, These were ten never-to-be-forgotten days spent on the ocean. Reading and exposition of the Gita occupied every morning, also reciting and translating poems and stories from the Sanskrit and chanting old Vedic hymns. The sea was smooth and at night the moonlight was entrancing. Those were wonderful evenings, the master paced up and down the deck, a majestic figure in the moonlight, stopping now and then to speak to us of the beauties of nature. And if all this Maya is so beautiful, 
think of the wondrous beauty of the reality behind it, he would exclaim. One especially fine evening when the moon was at the full and softly mellow and golden, a night of mystery and enchantment, he stood silently for a long time drinking in the beauty of the scene. Suddenly he turned to us and said, Why recite poetry when there, pointing to sea and sky, is the very essence of poetry? We reached New York all too soon, feeling that we never could be grateful enough for those blessed, intimate ten days with the Guru. The very afternoon of his arrival in New York from Glasgow, after visiting the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Leggett, the Swami with his Guru Bhai accompanied them to their beautiful country home called Ridgely Manor, on the Hudson, in the Catskill Mountains, about 150 miles from New York. He waited there, for the leading that he confidently expected, to show him where his next effort was to lie. A month later he was joined there by Sister Nivedita. The hosts with their family were devoted to the Swami, who was much better and had put himself under the treatment of a famous osteopath. He remained in this country retreat until 5th November. His presence was a constant delight to his hosts and his mind reverted to many interesting experiences of his former stay in America.